Python for about a decade. He is a co-author of WebPy, a micro web framework in Python. Today he will be talking about writing beautiful code. Let us welcome him, Anand. Can you hear me now? Cool. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about writing beautiful code. It's very hard to say, uh, hard to uh, tell someone how to write beautiful code uh, in maybe half an hour. Okay, it's very uh, hard. But uh, so what I'm going to do is to give a glimpse of what is a beautiful code. Okay, I and mean, what does it feel like? Okay, have you ever had a feeling? Have you ever had a feeling looking at some code and said, "Aha, this looks awesome." Right? Have you Raise your hand. How many people actually looked at some code and said, wow, this is good. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, it's very hard to quantify what that thing is. I'm trying to uh, convey that in this talk. Okay. Let's see how uh, well I'll be able to do that. Okay. So, that's me. Uh, I'm at Anandology, uh, wherever you find me on web. Uh, if you want to follow the slides, uh, I've just tweeted about the slides uh, there. So, uh, uh, what's beautiful code? How do you say code is beautiful? Okay, if we just take if let uh, let me take uh, uh, borrow this from uh, Christopher Alexander, who uh, coined the term pattern language, from whom uh, the design pattern all came out. He talks it that uh, when you say something is elegant, something is beautiful. It's very hard to quantify. He calls it the quality without a name. Okay, so it, it's it's very hard to say the code is beautiful. Can you say? can take two different codes and say which is beautiful, which is not. It's very hard to say. It, it has some qualities which we can say give pointers, but we can't really say pinpoint and say this is what makes code beautiful. Okay. So, uh, the best I could do is actually take a quote from uh, Tower Programming. A program should be light and agile. It's subroutines connected like string of pearls. The spirit and intent of the program is retained throughout. There should be, uh, there should neither uh, too little nor too much, neither needed loops nor users variables, neither lack of structure nor over rigidity. So, uh, you see, uh, when you look at a program, you have to have that kind of balance. It shouldn't be uh, uh, too unstructured or it shouldn't have too rigid. It should have the right size, it shouldn't be too big and too small. And you should, uh, the, uh, when you try to read the program, it should uh, convey the intent of the program, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, why do you really care about beautiful code? I mean, right? I mean, uh, uh, code is code. I mean, you write a code and it gets executed, and then job is done, right? Why do you really care about uh, writing code beautifully? I mean, uh, is it does it really matter at all? The reason is, uh, uh, well, we write code uh, for uh, getting a task done, but uh, if you think deeply, the progress must be written for people to read. And instant information to execute. What does mean is, when machine executes fine, but uh, uh, the most of the time when you write a program, uh, is spent and people looking at it, trying to understand, trying to maintain it. Have you ever had a case where you wrote a program and after a week you couldn't figure out what that thing is doing? Right? I mean, it happens to everyone. Okay. So, uh, uh, for the sake of your own self and for the for sake of others, you should try to uh, put some efforts to, uh, to write code uh, that's Readable. That's uh, people. That's that's beautiful. That people uh, can appreciate when someone reads your code. People should feel happy, not curse you, right? So uh, it's very important to make code uh, readable. So you should always keep the reader in mind. So when you're writing a program, you're writing for someone else to read and understand. Okay. You should always keep that in mind. Okay. When you're writing a program, it is for someone to read and then uh, uh, make sure that they don't curse you uh, after some time. Okay. So there are a lot of tips and tricks. Okay. I'll start with something uh, uh, which looks too trivial, okay, but uh, it's very, very important. I can't stress enough how important this is. Choosing, choose meaningful variable, meaningful names, okay. It's a variable name, a function name, or a class name, or a file name. When you're writing a program, uh, and I uh, teach Python professionally, and uh, I, I find very frustrating when I find people, even if uh, a lot of program experience, don't even pay attention to the kind of names that they pick. Uh, <coughs> it looks trivial, but uh, uh, it's really hard, really, really hard. Okay, finding the right name for a concept is really hard. Okay, what's the longest time that you have spent 
uh, trying to uh, uh, find a name for a variable, a function, or a class, or something. Ours? There is time I actually spent two days figuring out, uh, sitting and said, I don't like this name at all. Like, I want to call this class something else. And call a colleague of mine and say, hey, I don't like this. And I showed the air kushvir all the yeah. But see, the thing is, it's important to actually uh, pay attention to all these things. And name uh, really makes a lot of difference. Uh, when you're uh, choosing a name for a, for a function or a class, you're basically trying to inventing a new language for communicating. You, you take, you're introducing a new concept and someone trying to understand that is always going to use the same name. Uh, so you have to be very careful when you're picking these names. Uh, so that varies, depends on whether you're choosing a variable name which is used only in a function or a class or a module name, etc. So let me start with some simple tricks, okay. I'm sure it's, it's not going to be exhaustive. I'm going to start with some uh, small tips and tricks that you can uh, use it in uh, everyday uh, code. So first thing is avoid generic names. Don't say temp, temp to manage your data. Uh, it's kind of, okay, manage it of what? Data, okay, I know it's data, everything is data in a computer, but what does it really signify, right? And you say temp, and there's only temp used, so I use temp to here. But when you're using a variable name, I know it's a variable, but what does it convey? I and mean, what does it store? Someone looking at it should get a sense of what this thing is doing and what's meant for. So always avoid generic names. And also avoid abbreviations. Doesn't really convey much. Okay, let's say UCF, United, University of California, and I don't know, Foo, wherever, right? I don't know what this thing, right? So if it's HTTP, it makes sense. People, everyone understands HTTP. But if you say bank accounts, bar, right? <laughs> it doesn't make sense, okay? And uh, it's very common to actually use these conventions. And it's really bad, uh, so to always avoid it, okay? So use a for, call it formatter or an account or something. Okay, don't really just say, just use abbreviation because the class name is like that. And also avoid data types as names, sum of list. Okay, list of what, right? List of numbers, list of marks, list of prices. I don't know, what's that, right? Count words in a string. Okay, you always count words in a string, but what's a string? Are you getting a sentence? Are you getting a, uh, I don't know. So what are you getting there, right? <coughs> you're counting words in a name or you're counting words in a place or, right? So you use uh, uh, something that really says what that thing signifies. <coughs> and, uh, and this is something that we can also use. Uh, use nouns for variables and classes. Uh, so when you're using a, a, a variable or a class, typically it's a thing that you're saying, so give it a name, it's a noun. The size, price, task, a scheduler, a bank account, etc. When you're writing a function, you just try to use a verb. Get file size. Don't say file size because that's kind of sounds like uh, it's a noun. So use a get file size, make an account, or deposit, etc. So uh, and these are thumb rules. You shouldn't. You don't have to follow them. Really, but these are kind of guidelines. So that uh, and also the consistency is very important. So when you're trying to use uh, follow one convention, stick to it uh, throughout your program. And uh, use ruler for a list, but okay, that, that looks no brainer, okay. But I find like so many people don't really even care about it, okay. So it's the largest line uh, out of lines and then always start list it and call it files. But when you uh, look at look at the uh, program down here, so uh, by the way, I'm using red to indicate the code that's not nice and the green which is uh, better, okay. Here. Uh, if you look at file equal to OS.list directory, well, does it give a single file or do you give multiple files? It actually gives a list of files. But you could say file equal to, and it's fine, program, uh, the computer will not mind doing all that, but when someone reading that code will have a hard time figuring out what that thing is doing. And similarly, if you look at the next slide, uh, the next one, for lines in open file name dot read lines. It's read lines, so I'll call it lines. But when you're looping over, you're actually getting a single line, right? Not list of lines. So, uh, uh, when you say read lines, that gives a list of lines, but when you actually loop over the each individual element is a single line, not lines. <coughs> and uh, say int of lines, how can int work with the lines? It should take a single value. So it kind of, it is confusing, right? So you're basically uh, trying hard to confuse the user uh, so that your job is secure, but uh, <laughs> uh, don't do that uh, because uh, it, it's very, uh, uh, difficult to uh, understand what's going on and it's, uh, it makes the code error prone and a lot of people make mistakes and that's 
it may accidentally introduce some bug or something, okay. So always use a plural uh, when you have a list of values or any collection of values. So the name that you pick kind of indicate uh, uh, the intent, what you're trying to keep there. So it kind of tell you, uh, hint about uh, what value you're trying to hold inside that variable. And uh, and reserve i and j for indices, that's a convention people follow in all programming languages, i and j is for loop indices, okay. So for i in range 10 print i is fine because i is going over an index. Don't say i in numbers because i is not an index here, i is a, you're going over a list of numbers, right. So don't say i, it kind of looks like you're going over an index and uh, and people say numbers of i, print numbers of i, what that, that's not, that's not correct, right, because I kind of gives an impression that uh, you're going over an index. Well, in this particular case, that's not, and uh, uh, that's again confuses the people. Don't use that. So when you're using uh, something that's not an index, use some other uh, variable name. Use for any numbers. It's usually nice to say a short form of uh, what variable name we have. So num uh, for any numbers for W in words, that's kind of easy to understand. W would mean something. What you have up there. Uh, Okay, so I have a puzzle for you. This is a small five line program. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes for you to think about it, okay. Look at this program and tell me what this thing does. Think about it, okay. So just five line program. Any guesses? So, okay. So let me, this is just five line program, right? Imagine if this is were a hundred line or thousand line program, how do you feel? Just, just a, it's just a five line program and just, uh, we're still debating what this thing is doing, okay. Imagine if it's a thousand line program or a million line, right, um, software tends to grow, okay. And compared to this, I've not changed any of the program uh, structure except the names, okay. The only difference between these two programs is the names that I've chosen. Okay, does it make sense now? Yes? You don't have to think twice, right, it's get column, text data set and the column index and gives you the column from the data set, okay. Look at this, does it, is it doing exactly the same thing? Just the names, okay, and names make so much difference. It's just a four line function, okay. Imagine what would happen if we're actually writing a hundred line program this way. And it's very, very important, okay. I can't stress enough how important uh, the names are, okay. It's okay to spend an hour figuring out what name I want to use this for a function or a variable, okay. Uh, you'll be thankful that you did. Uh, Right, so it makes a lot of difference uh, when you look at, so when you, uh, so take time to uh, pick right names. When you use the variable name, uh, uh, spend time to figure out what's the right uh, name to uh, ex uh, indicate what the value that variable holds. And coming from, uh, so this one mistake that we do is kind of try to use some variable x and y, okay. When using similar names like x and y, Unconsciously we think that they're kind of similar types, kind of there's a relation between those two because it's uh, X and Y or P and Q when you use, it kind of feels like they are of the same data type and, uh, and uh, never uh, do that kind of things when they're not, okay. So always avoid that. For example, in this example, so X and Y, X and Y looks uh, as if, uh, I mean it's not written anywhere but unconsciously we feel that. Uh, both of them are of the same type. You're getting two lists or two variables or two strings or something, okay. But here actually the X is actually a list and Y is just a number. And so that's very, very confusing and avoid that in all cases. So whenever you have uh, similar names, use them only when they actually uh, have similar data type, etc. So always avoid uh, 
uh, that when you using it for different uh, data types. So here A1 and A2, A1 is a list and A2 is a number, it's better to say it's values on N or something. So that's about names, okay. Uh, now before I uh, jump to the other one, let me stress again, names are very, very important. And uh, it's not as e easy as it sounds. Like look at an example and say that looks better than previous one. But a uh, lot of times uh, we write code uh, like that. And not only, I mean, everyone does it, and even I do it when I'm in a hurry, okay. And uh, it's okay to do it in a hurry, but you have to remember that that's not the right way, and we'll come back and fix it at a later point. And, uh, and you should always take time to spend, uh, spend time to pick the right names. Uh, it's perfectly fine to spend half a day to figure out what name I want to give it for a class, okay. I mean, it's perfectly fine. Don't feel guilty that I didn't do any work today uh, because it happens, right? At the end of the day, you, unless you write some code, you feel guilty. Well, at least I do a lot of times. So, uh, 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 understand that uh, picking the right names takes time and it's okay to spend the time on it. And uh, you'll be very thankful that you did that time. Uh, or someone else who is reading your code will be very thankful to you because you spend time and then pick the right names, okay. Now let's uh, look at program organization. Um, now the picking the names is the logo hanging fruit, okay. It doesn't take a lot of effort, uh, but it also, it makes the code a lot readable and uh, et cetera. But there's other things that are also important. Uh, one of that is uh, how do you organize your programs. So the important thing is you have to uh, divide the program into smaller parts that can be understandable uh, independently. So split the program into smaller independent modules and functions. What that I mean is, when I say independent functions, uh, when you have a big program, it's very hard to understand all of it at once. So break it into smaller functions so that each function can be understood independently. That way, you don't have to understand the entire program at once. You can look at each part and understand what that thing is doing. <coughs> and the uh, avoid duplication. So don't try to repeat the same code again and again. Don't copy and paste the same thing and then say x here and y here, etc. Try to generalize that. And probably write a function, etc. to reuse that again and again. And uh, there is a 7 plus or minus 2 rule. Uh, it's called Miller's Law. Uh, so it says the number of objects a human can hold in working memory is 7 plus or minus 2. So it just says that an average human can't remember more than 7 uh, around seven uh, things is what someone can remember in short-term memory, okay. What are the, I mean, how, I mean, how is it relevant here, okay. That's probably the number of lines you should want to have in your function, okay. If you have more than that, by the time you come to the end of the function, you probably forget what's up there, okay. And it's very, very important because uh, when you have a 200-line uh, function, it's very hard to make sense of it because you start reading it and then you forget what's, uh, what you started, where you started with, and you go again, and then you forget again, right? So you should always try to make, that's kind of a ballpark figure n number to say, if you're writing a class, make sure you don't have, that's a, that's a, a ballpark number to have number of function methods that you want to have in a class. Uh, if you're writing a, a function, that's kind of number of lines that you want to have it in. Okay, probably okay to uh, have exceptions, you may want to have 10 or 15 sometimes, but uh, usually, seven or less than that is what uh, I consider uh, right size for a function. So there are a lot of uh, other tricks in the program organization is a uh, lot of, avoid uh, too many nested levels. So this example, uh, what I'm doing is, uh, uh, so taking a blog post and then uh, there are different actions that you can do there. So if it's an update title, if title is empty, do something. If it's not empty, then go and update it. If it's a add tag. So it's very common to actually have uh, uh, functions which does multiple things and uh, you have a lot of checks and conditions here. So it's too difficult to actually understand this because uh, uh, there are different, a uh, lot of nested levels here. So what you can do is take each of the levels here and then turn that into a different function. Okay. So what this thing is doing is all is using the dispatching here. It looks at the action, then dispatch it to appropriate function, and then you can go and figure out what each function is doing. So don't, so this uh, has only one level of nesting, and everything else is pushed to other functions. So now understanding this function is very easy, right? So all it does is look at the action, and then uh, dispatch it to appropriate function, and then you can go and then see what each function is doing if you're really interested in that, okay? That way it makes it a lot easier to read and follow. 
The second thing is, uh, the other thing is, uh, you should try to suppress the details as much as possible. What do I mean by this is, uh, uh, <coughs> when we uh, <coughs> uh, write a program, the what the program is doing and how the program is doing are two different things, okay. Someone want to understand what program is doing, you shouldn't have to understand the nuts and bolts of it. So, for example, the main function here is saying that this program is doing four things. It's taking the file name from the command line argument, treating words from the file, computing the frequency of those words and printing the frequency. It's doing these four things, okay. How is it doing all these things? Well, there are other functions you go and figure out if you really want to figure out how those things are being done. But what the program is doing and how the program is doing are two different things and you should kind of try to separate those two things. Why is it important? Because uh, uh, when someone want to come and understand what program is doing, he's not really interested in how are you reading files or how do you compute word frequency. I just want to figure out what this program is actually doing and is it something that I, I should use or not, right? So, uh, the what the program is doing uh, should be different from how the program is doing and you should try to separate these two things. So, when you are writing the main function, okay, uh, this is why I always uh, teach when I uh, uh, introduce programming to people is, you are writing, solving problem, don't jump into details, okay. Don't jump into details at all. Think of what all things that you need to do so, and write a main function and then write, put a function call for each one of them and then go and figure out how to do each one of them at later point. But the function is doing these five steps, I need to do these five steps to solve this problem and then put these five steps here. So, the main number of lines in the main is kind of number of steps that you need to solve the problem. So, without even having to worry about how each one is uh, improve, is done, you can actually write the main and then uh, see if that is good enough and then go and uh, put in all those uh, uh, details later. Uh, the other thing is uh, a lot of times we want to handle error cases etc in the program and if you see in this case, uh, you want to get a user from the email address. So, if the it's a valid user, do this else, raise an exception. But if the user is blocked, then say account is blocked and else this is what we really want to do, okay. Now, if you see the, the core of the function is deep inside two nested levels. If you want to make any modifications, you have to come and do it here, okay. That is kind of not nice, not elegant at all, okay. So, what you should do is you should handle error separately so that the main program stays in the top level. So, here is what my recommendation would be, okay. So, you have this error conditions done in the beginning of the function and you exit early and then the, the core of the function is always at the first level, right. So, when you have that core of the function deep inside any of nested levels, it becomes too difficult to uh, understand and modify. It does not feel right, okay. So, try to see if you can uh, uh, exit early. So, there are special cases and when you are trying to understand the program, okay, I know there is error conditions, I do not have to care about that. I want to understand what the function is doing when the right input is given, this is what I need to look at. But uh, if you look at here, even to understand what the program does in the right case, okay, what is the right case at all here? Is that the right case or the second one is the right case? It is kind of too uh, difficult to uh, get that. But here, uh, so what uh, we are trying to do is we are trying to separate out the uh, exceptional cases. So, we do the error checks first and then uh, the body of the, the core of the function is there. So, if you want to understand what the program does, uh, most of the times this is what you should look at, okay. And uh, so, that is program organization. Uh, there are more things, I am sure I am only giving a glimpse of uh, some of the tips, uh, you can even talk about, you can write functions that are stateless or there are, more, there are more, many more uh, uh, tricks and tips, but uh, uh, let me uh, uh, focus on the, the comments part here. Now, when you are writing comments, comments are important, they help in uh, understanding the program, okay. But do not say the obvious, say increment x by 2. I know, I, I can read Python, I can say x equal x plus 2, right, okay. But say why you are doing it, right. So, add, so comments should add, uh, uh, so why are you adding 2, you are compensating for border on both sides. So, there is 1 on here, so x incremented by 2, okay. So, you should, comments should actually say, uh, why you are doing something, not just do not say just obvious because you have to write a comment, Com writing comments is a good habit. So, you write a comment for everything, but that is not good, right. So, when you are adding a comment, make sure that it is adding some value. 
and also a lot of times you, you want to explain why you made a choice, okay. So there is uh, uh, a code which is looks too complicated but maybe there is a reason for it, okay. The following is an optimization to save a lot of memcache calls handled with care, okay. So, uh, right, so there is a block of code that looks complicated but there is a reason for it to be here and explain why you are doing it. And, and document special cases, a lot of times when you have a software you are maintaining it for a long time, a lot of uh, historical cases that come in. You say that uh, suddenly you realize that the user is complaining that uh, his user account is not working, okay. You don't know why it's, you spend time, you couldn't figure out why it's happening, okay. You figure out that there is an Unicode error happening, okay. I don't know what to do but this seems to be fixing that issue, you put it there, okay. Now that looks fine when you do it but after if you come up, come back after a couple of months and see why this thing is here, you the context is lost. So you probably want to keep the historical context there so that someone down the line reading it will figure out that why this thing is added here, right. So probably what I usually do is I put my name and say date and say this is the time when we added this for this particular reason, okay. So when someone reading that code will probably get a historical context which otherwise is missing in the program. So those are the ways where you want to use comments. And uh, the beauty is when you actually write programs where comments are unnecessary, you can make your program self explanatory at all by, so that you do not have to write comments at all, okay. So uh, writing comments is good but if you can write a program where comments are not required, that is even more awesome. For example, just look at these two cases, okay. Uh, so find length of the longest line, it is a max of length of line for line in length, so it computes maximum, okay. But can I just say length of longest of lines? That just makes the comment unnecessary, okay, because the code is self explanatory. So you should try to uh, make the code uh, explain by itself, not, uh, I mean there are a lot of times it is not possible but wherever you can, you should try to achieve this. So you do not have to write a comment at all. So uh, try to simplify it so that looking at that one line, people will understand what this thing exactly doing. You do not have to specially add a comment to say that. So, uh, and then uh, when you are writing a long, a large func uh, bigger functions probably want to add block comments. You say step one process documents and then upload them to search engine, right, you are operating a search engine. So you want to do is process documents and then uh, upload them to search engine, okay. But why not actually move them to different function? Say that docs equal to process documents and search engine submit and docs, you do not need the doc, you do not need the comment anymore now, okay. The function name that I have chosen is a documentation, right. You look at the function name, you are processing documents first and then submitting to search engine and that is what the comments are doing there, okay. So uh, by picking the right names and splitting the program in the right way, you can make comments unnecessary and I think that is uh, uh, that is best you could do, okay. Writing comments to uh, explain something is doing is, is good but uh, uh, writing code such that you do not even have the right comments is even better. So let me summarize, uh, uh, spend time to choose meaningful variable names, it is very, very important and it is not that hard uh, and that is a thing where we usually uh, do not pay attention to, uh, I cannot stress enough how important that is. Write smaller functions, remember the 7 plus or minus 2 rule, suppress the details whenever possible. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so, uh, the what and how should be treated differently. When someone looks at your program, you should understand what the program is doing first before having to understand how the program is doing. If you combine these two, it becomes too hard, okay. <coughs> Whether you're using a link list for doing it or using a dictionary, I don't care, but you just want to understand what you're doing, right. So the what and how should be treated differently. And always optimize for readability. So when you're uh, writing a program, Think about what will someone reading this code think about it, will he understand it. So that is, you should always keep in mind, you should always keep the reader in mind when uh, uh, writing a program. So that is and if you have any questions, I am ready to take questions. I am sure uh, this is not all you need to know to write beautiful code, I just I thought I gave a glimpse of what beautiful code looks like and uh, what are the kind of things that we should care for. And uh, yeah, I am sure like many of you already have other tips and tricks.
So let me know if you have any questions. So I like to have a, a small clarification or so just little suggestion maybe uh, like when I'm using uh, when I write lines of course right so we actually maintain something like uh, 80 80 characters in a line or 120 characters in a line yeah. whatever it may be. So when I'm right uh, in some cases uh, I have a uh, URL which needs to be added in a comment or something okay uh, which is which spans up to 150 characters okay so sometimes I feel like uh, we can cross that 120 mark and it can go up to 150 characters in the same line so that looks beautiful but the next day when I come and see that looks ugly to me. No, so see, I think if it's a comment I wouldn't mind okay. No but maybe maybe as a uh, when, when we pass it as a string or something something in the yeah, code. So, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's a, that's a good point. So the thing is if it's part of code that is the URL that you want to put in a function okay. So I always so what I usually do is uh, if it's a function that has uh, query strings I put the URL plus query string in the next line okay. Or can I move the URL outside the function? Can you put it as a global variable so that you can start using from the first column? And so those are the kind of. I think you have to look at the case by case basis. And uh, for URLs, what I usually do is when the URL is long, I try to put it outside the function and make it a global variable so that they have more uh, horizontal space. Okay. Does that Be answer so your question? So it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of answers my question. So it's better to avoid things. Yeah. Yeah. So if it's part of the function, I usually. If it's a longer one, I just put it outside, put a global variable, give it a name. And if it has query string, break it and then put it in the next line. Sure, thank you. Um, hi. Yeah. So you offhandedly mentioned that you should try making the function stateless. And yeah. So why is that? I, I didn't follow. Okay, so uh, I thought of including that, but I thought we wouldn't have enough time to get into that. The reason is uh, when you're trying to understand uh, a program, you're also trying to understand the interactions between different functions, okay. So if you have too many functions depend on each other, each function is changing something, another function depends on that, it becomes too difficult to understand. So uh, uh, when you make function status, what I mean is, let me give an example. Let's say there's a class that initializes uh, prices table. Can I have a function init prices that changes the class, uh, the instance variable sets the prices, okay. Or you could have a function read prices that returns the prices back to you. I would prefer the later one because this function is independent, it's completely independent in its own, it doesn't depend on anything else, it doesn't modify any state, okay. That way it's easy to test and easy to understand. When I read this program, I don't uh, have to worry about what if someone modifies the prices, is price getting modified anywhere else because this is not, this, this particular function doesn't depend on anything else, okay. So when you have a lot of functions, let's say you have a class which has 10 functions, each trying to work on a global state then you have to make sure that you understand all the interactions of all the 10 functions. Whereas if you have 8 functions which are independent and only 2 functions which are working with the global state, it's a lot easier to, a lot simpler. That way writing stateless functions make things easy, okay. When I say stateless, uh, the other uh, related thing is also you should try to make sure the functions don't have any side effects. What I mean is uh, don't modify the arguments that you get. For example, if you're using standard Python standard library, Always use sorted, don't use sort function, so sort method because sort changes that in place, sorted gives new list. So that's an example of uh, not having side effects, okay. Thank you. Sure, I think there's a question here. Um, so this is actually in line with the first question. Yeah. Uh, in my organization, we strictly follow the pay paid guidelines and okay. uh, it has 80 characters limit. Okay. So sometimes what happens is it's really annoying uh, and it's uh, re definitely not a readable code uh, for someone to look at. Uh, I mean, if someone looks at your code. Uh, so what's your suggestion on that? I mean, I mean following pay paid is not readable or? Uh, uh, I mean, let's say, yeah, sometimes following, I mean, ha ha having that 80 characters limit or uh, I mean that actually uh, brings you to break your code in the next line and okay, so sometimes so it's not readable at all. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I think what I would say is these are guidelines not, uh, you shouldn't stick to them religiously, okay. The other thing is also when you're using variable names, uh, if you're inside a smaller function, it's okay to use small names. So maybe that's what causing, uh, so uh, the different tricks to break uh, bigger lines into smaller names, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, inside a class, so inside a smaller function, it's okay to use smaller variable names. You don't have to say uh, uh, line length, you could just say n because it's a small context and you can understand what n means. 
But if it's a class, uh, if it's a, a variable, uh, uh, if a field that you are putting in a, in a class, then you have to worry about the interdependencies between functions, so you have to put a longer name there. So that way you can reduce it, okay. And you have a longer expression, maybe see, you should see if you can split that into smaller sub-expressions and then use it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, uh, we could go ahead with one more question. Uh, we have one in the back. Hi Anand, uh, thanks for this talk, uh, it was informative and I have uh, a suggestion and I want your opinion on it. Uh, a few months ago I was reading this book, The Beautiful Code, uh, where it contains uh, one of the first example is a simple regular expression parser written by Brian Carnagnan and Dennis Ritchie, uh, maybe even Rob Pike, the inventors of the C language. So I think the important thing that they stressed upon was uh, any function, uh, whatever you write, should address the most important use cases first and handle the uh, edge cases or border conditions uh, at a much later stage. Okay. So that the intent of the function is clear and uh, the function that solves 95% of the use cases or 99% is what is uh, easier to maintain than when you clutter it with all the edge case uh, handling and stuff. So I wanted to know what is your opinion on that. Okay, so uh, could this repeat? So I think what important thing to make is the, the important thing here is uh, the most common use case should be prominent. I think that's what the important right. message of that, okay. So now how you do it is different, when people have different opinions on that, but the important message there is the most prominent use case, um, the most common use case should be the prominent in your function, okay. So let me go back to the uh, thing where I've taken here, okay. So uh, the most common use case here is the three lines there, okay. Now, uh, so what I am saying is that don't keep it hidden inside two level nestedness, but keep it, bring it to the top level, okay. So, uh, uh, so what you are doing is uh, having error conditions and then the core here, but when you look at the program structure, you immediately know that this is the core of the function and that's just the error conditions, okay. I think, it, I think the important thing is we should not really go by uh, the words, but try to understand what. Uh, what do you mean by that? The, what they mean by that is the core of the program, the most common use case should be prominently visible in the program and people should be able to reach there uh, the moment they look at the function. I think that's what it is, okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. And also, in, uh, in fact, uh, uh, forgot to mention, so I mean, all these things are not something that I have invented. I mean, these things are in age old wisdom. I mean, uh, so <coughs> there's a book by Kernigan and uh, Plager, if I believe, it's a, the element of programming style. So that book talks, that's probably in, in 1970s or something, uh, that uh, has a lot of these rules, uh, uh, rather tips, uh, but they use photon to explain a uh, lot of these concepts and uh, many of them still hold true, but a lot of them are not because uh, at those days you spend, uh, uh, be very careful of the efficiency and all those things, but now readability is at most important because efficiency really doesn't matter so much unless you're running those things at millions and billions of times. And uh, yeah, there are many other books as well. Okay, uh, the, uh, the time is up for the talk. Thank sure. you so much Anand for the- Thanks, so talk. I'm around if you want to catch